வணக்கம் வி ஆல் நோ தட் அப்போனன்ஸ் பிளாஸ்டி இஸ் அ டைப் ஆஃப் டெண்டன் ட்ரான்ஸ்ஃபர் தட் வி நீட் டு டூ ஃபார் அ பேஷண்ட் ஹூ ஹேஸ் அ ப்ராப்ளம் ஆர் இன்ஜுரி டு த மீடியன் நர்வ் பட் த கொஷன் இஸ் வில் வி கெட் குட் ரிசல்ட்ஸ் வில் த ஹேண்ட் பி யூஸ்ஃபுல் ஆஃப்டர் சச் அ ப்ரொசீஜர் எஸ் இட் வில் பி யூஸ்ஃபுல் பட் வி நீட் டு ஃபாலோ எயிட் கோல்டன் பிரின்சிபல்ஸ் இஃப் வி வாண்ட் டு கெட் குட் ரிசல்ட்ஸ் and these eight principles are what we are going to talk about in this video before we learn how to get good results after opponents plasty let us first see what is normal thumb opposition normal thumb opposition consists of three serial movements the first is radial abduction and then palmar abduction the next is pronation by pronation we mean that the thumb which was facing ulnar ward is now facing dorsally so it has pronated and thirdly flexion this flexion should occur at the carpometacarpal joint this pinch may be of different types let us see what sort of pinch signifies true opposition of the thumb sometimes no pinch occurs this signifies that there is loss of opposition sometimes there is tip to side that is tip of the thumb to the side of the terminal phalangeal region of the finger this is not true opposition sometimes there is only a tip to tip pinch possible this is also not true opposition true opposition is said to occur when a pulp to pulp pinch is possible that is the pulp of the thumb opposes to the pulp of the respective finger here you will note that the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb is held straight so when a patient attempts opposition like this we know that it is not true opposition and he needs an opponent's plasty this was a young boy who had a tumor involving the median nerve which was removed and it is the dream of every surgeon to get a good opposition after an appropriate tendon transfer but uh, how can we achieve it there are eight points to consider to get good results in opponents plasty and each and every single point is important to contribute to the ultimate good results it must begin with a good clinical examination of the hand and of the patient the second is a good evaluation of what we examine thirdly we need to make a good plan which means that we need to decide on what procedure is to be done and when is it to be done the fourth is choosing a good motor for the tendon transfer that alone is not enough because it must follow a correct and good route and then get into a good insertion which is appropriate for that patient it must be followed up with good immobilization like in any hand surgery a follow up is very important when we talk about a good clinical examination of a patient with a median nerve injury requiring an opponents plasty apart from the regular examination there are three important points to be examined what is it that the patient does not have does he not have abduction of the thumb or does he not have the pronation aspect or does he not have the flexion aspect because we know that all these three contribute to a good opposition to make my point clear let us see some examples in this patient you will note two points one there is only a tip to tip pinch between the thumb and the little finger and secondly there is a lot of flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint this means that it is not true opposition what is happening is that the patient does not have palmar abduction which is why there is a compensation by the flexor pollicis brevis which is active in this patient so it is palmar abduction or positioning of the thumb which is deficient in this patient in this patient there is no opposition at all even the tip of the thumb does not reach the tip of the little finger in this patient who has had a carpal tunnel release you will note that on attempted opposition the thumb is not pronating at all it continues to face 
on the flexor side that is volarly. So there is a lack of pronation in this patient. In this patient you will note that the thumb is totally supinated and it flexes at the interphalangeal joint. This is a classic example of a total claw where even the flexor pollicis brevis is not acting. So here again there is a loss of abduction, pronation and flexion of the thumb. After a good clinical examination, we will note that not every patient with a median nerve palsy will need an opponent's plasty. That is because there could be a compensation by dual innervation of the flexor pollicis brevis or action of the radial nerve directed abductor pollicis longus or a communication between the nerves, for example, the Ricci canoe anastomosis. We also need to take into account the hand that is involved and the occupation of the patient. You can click on the link above to see more about the detailed clinical examination of a hand with a median nerve injury. Having done a good clinical examination, we must now evaluate. And by evaluation, I mean we need to look at the recipient factors before we plan for a tendon transfer. And the most important recipient factors are the availability of a good soft tissue coverage by which we mean that the skin should be soft and supple with no induration or edema. The tissues must be soft and supple, specifically the thumb web. The joints must be soft and supple with a full passive range of movements. And we need to evaluate the carpometacarpal joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and the thumb web space specifically about the carpometacarpal joint need to be tested. The first is subluxation. The examiner holds the metacarpal of the thumb and pulls and pushes on the thumb along its long axis. This is not possible normally but when the joint is subluxated it will move. To evaluate for any joint contractures, we need to take hold of the thumb by the metacarpal lift it off and across the palm as much as possible. If the terminal phalanx of the thumb can now face the base of the ring or little fingers, it indicates that there is no contracture of the joint in external rotation. For assessing the instability, we apply resistance against the flexion of the thumb by applying counter pressure against the proximal phalanx and the terminal phalangeal regions. Normally, the metacarpophalangeal joint will remain stable when this force is being given. If there is instability of the metacarpophalangeal joint, it will immediately collapse and become hyperextended, causing the characteristic Z deformity. This indicates that the flexor pollicis brevis is not strong enough and can cause a problem after a tendon transfer is done. Status of the extensor tendon that is the EPL acting on the interphalangeal joint of thumb. If there is an extensor lag, it indicates that the EPL is either weak or damaged over the interphalangeal joint. The next important point to assess is the thumb web. If the thumb web is short or contracted or tight, the tendon transfer for opponent's plasty will obviously not work. The first is we need to hold the metacarpal of the thumb and abduct the thumb and then measure the angle made by the first and second metacarpals. This must be a minimum of 40 degrees. If it is less than this, it indicates a contracture and must be released before any tendon transfer is done. After clinically examining the patient, and evaluating the problem, we need to make a plan. And this will consist of what procedure needs to be done. So we need to consider what should be the characteristic of the muscle that we should be transferring. That is the donor factors. We should consider the amplitude, the power, and remember that it is only one function for one tendon, use of synergistic muscle, a straight line of transfer, and we should also consider the expendability of the muscle that we are planning to use. You can click on the icon above to see more details about the basics of tendon transfers. So having decided to do a tendon transfer for opponent's plasty, we need to choose the correct motor in the correct situation. The options available are the flexor digitorum superficialis of the ring finger described by Sterling Bunnell the extensor indices proprius transfer described by Burkhalter, 
The transfer of the palmaris longus for opponent's plasty described by Camets, which is usually used in carpal tunnel syndrome. The abductor digite minime transfer described by Huber, which is usually used for reconstruction of the hypoplastic thumb or the use of the extensor carpi ulnaris. The flexor digitorum superficialis is a good option for opponent's plasty when the hands of the patient are short stubby with sturdy fingers and also in low median nerve palsy. But the contraindications for using the flexor digitorum superficialis is in high median nerve palsies and also the flexor digitorum superficialis of the ring finger should not be used for opponent's plasty in combined median and ulnar nerve palsies, especially high ulnar nerve palsy where it is possible that the flexor digitorum profundus of the ring finger is also paralyzed. The extensor indices proprius is an ideal transfer and it is used when the flexor pollicis brevis function is present and it is needed only to replace the abduction function. It can also be used in high median nerve palsy or traumatic injuries that simultaneously affect the extrinsic flexor tendons precluding the use of the flexor digitorum superficialis. And it can also be used in combined median and ulnar nerve palsy. Choosing a good motor for tendon transfer is excellent. But even more important is the route that we take for the transferred tendon to reach the thumb. We all know that a straight line pull is very important, but it is not possible always. So we will have to make a turn somewhere, which means we need to have a pulley at some point which will control the direction in which the pull is being exerted because this can ultimately affect the final result that we are going to get after opponent's plasty. The commonly described routes are the adductor route, the flexor retinacular pulley route, the pisiform pulley which goes through the Guyans canal or the flexor carpi ulnaris pulley which can also go around the lower end of the ulna. Why the choice of selecting the route is so important is because each route has its own dynamics and has a vector of pull which could be a flexion vector, an opposition vector or a palmar abduction vector. Let us try to understand this first. When we use the adductor root, it will produce more of flexion at the carpometacarpal joint, so it is called the flexion vector. When we use the pisiform root, it produces more of opposition or pronation of the thumb. So it is called the opposition vector. Here the thumb is pronated and gets to face the fingers. When we use the FCU root, it produces more of palmar abduction. That is, the thumb is placed in a position of palmar abduction so that it can oppose to the fingers. We can make a subcutaneous tunnel also. But if it is not taken deep enough, it may slowly migrate and loosen the tension over the years as the thumb is being used. Another point to remember is that if the ulnar nerve is not involved, it may be risky to tunnel through the Gans canal for fear of injury, otherwise it's an excellent pulley. Going through a rent in the flexor retinaculum or in other words a flexor retinacular window may be a good option but gliding may not be good enough because it can get scarred. If we are using the extensor carpi ulnaris or extensor indices proprius, then the lower end of ulna is ideal as it has to curve around it from the extensor side to reach the thumb anyway. Now that the transfer tendon has reached the thumb, we need to give a correct and appropriate insertion depending on what we want to achieve. The Brand's technique of inserting to the abductor pollicis brevis and extensor pollicis longus and also to the adductor pollicis will help to achieve all three functions that is abduction, pronation and flexion of the thumb. The Littler's technique of insertion is only into the abductor pollicis brevis tendon which can be used when there is only a problem of palmar abduction 
and flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint is very good because the flexor pollicis brevis is acting well. The Rayodan's technique is when the transfer tendon is woven into the abductor pollicis brevis and then attached to the EPL by a Y insertion. And this is ideal when there is a combined median and ulnar nerve palsy. Even after choosing a correct insertion, the tension in which the suturing is done must also be considered. The best is to use the tenodesis effect. That is, the thumb must go into maximum opposition when the wrist is passively extended and maximum extension when the wrist is passively flexed. It must be followed up with a good immobilization, keeping the thumb in palmar abduction and the position of the thumb in line with the position of the middle finger. This immobilization must be maintained for 3 weeks. After 3 weeks, the splint can be removed and mobilization should be done with intermittent application of the splint for a further 3 weeks. Mobilization without a splint can be done after 6 weeks from the date of surgery, but night splinting is advised for a further 3 weeks. All that we have done so far perfectly and well may not work if a good follow-up is not done. A follow-up consists of the regular measures like washing the hand and oil massage and along with that re-education of the transfer tendon is a must. The patient must understand what has been done and what he must do now to get good results. So the role of therapy is very important. Let us see some examples. This is a young man with a combined median and ulnar nerve palsy following trauma to the wrist. You can make out a total lack of opposition and a total claw. And this is the result at the end of one month after surgery where I have done an extensor indices proprius transfer for opposition and a lasso procedure for the claw correction simultaneously. He is able to get the fingers into lumbrical position and opposition of the thumb with all the fingers is possible. This hand that we saw earlier where only flexion is present at the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb and only tip to side pinch is possible of the thumb with a little finger has undergone an opponent's plasty and now he is able to do a complete opposition of pulp to pulp of the thumb to the little finger and the metacarpophalangeal joint is kept straight while this opposition is being done. So to summarize, let us again go through the 8 points that we need to consider if we want to get good results in opponent's plasty. The first is a good clinical examination and here we need to examine well to find out what is actually the deficit or what the patient needs to get good opposition. We then need to evaluate the hand and the thumb, look for any stiffness or contracture of the thumb web because correction of all these should be done before the surgical procedure of tendon transfer is done. We need to make a good plan for the surgery and the timing of surgery. Choosing the motor is also important. The usual choices are flexor digitorum superficialis of the ring finger or the extensor indices proprius. Each has its own indications and advantages. We need to choose a good route because we need to achieve specific targets in specific hands and patients. And this transfer tendon should be sutured to the correct insertion to get the movement that is desired. Absolute immobilization is a must after surgery and a good follow-up which includes motor re-education is also very important. So these are the 8 important points to achieve good results in opponent's plasty. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more about the problems of the median nerve and tendon transfers. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning, hand surgery, plastic surgery, trauma surgery and ethics. Banakam.